Welcome to the first ever Latinx Kidlit Book Festival. Bienvenidos a todos al primer festival de libros Kidlit Latinx. Before we begin, I've been asked to draw your attention to the anti-harassment policy in the chat box and to remind everyone to use respectful language. My name is Monica Brown, me llamo Monica Brown, and I am today's moderator. I'm also the Peruvian American author of Marisol McDonald Doesn't Match, No Combina, uh, Waiting for the Biblioburo, Esperando el Biblioburo, and the Lola Levine chapter book series. Um, my newest release is Charuco, el arqueólogo Julio C. Tello, illustrated by the amazing Elisa Chavari. And um, it's about Peruvian archeologist, Julio Citeo. My mother was born in Piura, Peru, but she spent her teens in Lima and lived on a house on Julio Citeo Boulevard. And that's how I got to know this amazing story of Peru's indigenous hero and archeologist. And I'm excited for children to read about it. I am both privileged and delighted to moderate this panel of incredible authors as we discuss the use of Spanish and Spanglish in Latinx children's literature and the more general topic of bilingual books and what they do in the world. Let me introduce our distinguished writers and then we get to hear their wisdom and find out about their work. If you could wave as I introduce you, that would be great writers. I'm gonna start with Lulu Delacre. Author, illustrator, Lulu Delacre was born and raised in Puerto Rico and is a New York Times best-selling illustrator. She is also the creator of over 40 titles for children. Her books have won countless awards and starred reviews and include most recently, Lucy Soares and Olinguito de la A a la C. Olinguito from A to Z, both of which she wrote and illustrated, and Turning Pages, Pasando Paginas, written by none other than Sonia Sotamayor and illustrated by Lulu. Lulu de Lacre is also the author illustrator of the middle grade collection, Us in Progress, Stories of Young Latinos. Mariana Llanos was born in Lima, Peru, and is the author most recently of Eunice and Kate, and Lucas Bridge, El Puente de Luca. I am so very excited about her forthcoming picture book, Run Little Chasqui, an Inca Trail Adventure, a work of historical fiction set in the ancient Inca empire and out this May. Uh, she is also a founding member of Latinx Pitch, which helps Latinx writers find agents and editors. Thanks for your generosity, Mariana. Rene Colato Lainez, <laughs> my old friend, was born in El Salvador. He's a writer and an educator known by his students as the teacher full of stories. His bilingual picture books include My Shoes and I, Mis Zapatos y Yo, From North to South, Del Norte al Sur, and The Tooth Fairy Meets El Raton Perez, among many others. His books have received multiple starred reviews, and most recently in 2019, Rene was an NSK Newstat Award finalist, which is a great honor. Next, we have Natalia Sylvester, who she too was born in Lima, Peru. I got ahead of myself before, and is the author of two acclaimed novels written for adults, as well as the politically engaging, powerful, and funny YA Running, her debut YA, which received many starred reviews and is a junior library guild selection. Her second YA, which will is going to be published in 2022 by Clarion Books. Welcome all. Let's dive into a conversation and let's begin with asking each of you to share a little bit about your cultural, linguistic, and literary background and how it informs your writing. We'd love to know what languages or modalities your books are available in and what you're working on right now or your latest book is. So I'm gonna start with Lulu. 
Well, I'm delighted to be here, Monica. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, my parents were from Argentina, uh, grandmother from Uruguay, married to the son of a Cuban. And I have friends from all over Latin America. So Latin America is in everything I do. Um, I, uh, my latest book, it's uh, Lucy Source, and it's a book that I both wrote and illustrated. And um, Lucy Source is about a girl born without a shadow. And when Lucy realizes that her difference can be a strength, she soars. It is a book that deals with bullying and how you can, how we all can, a superpower, the superpower of uh, looking at something that hurts us or looking at a difference as a strength. So. Thanks, Lulu. How about you, Mariana? Yes, well, also to tell you that I'm excited to be here and talking to all of you amazing authors. So um, I am, uh, I was born in Lima, Peru. So I am 100% Peruvian, born and raised there. Spanish is my first language. And I learned English actually when I was in Peru, when I lived in Peru, I, I took three years of um, English there in, uh, in, a, in a school. And then when I moved to the United States about 18 years ago, I started writing also in English, not only in, in Spanish. So um, yeah, so that, that's what I do. I write in both languages. I am very committed to write also in Spanish because you know being my first language is important uh, for me. And also, I want uh, kids from uh, from my cultural homes or who, have, uh, or who are bilingual to understand that it is very important to keep our language alive as well. Um, being bilingual is a tool. So um, some of my work is, is a bilingual. For example, uh, Lucas Bridge, El Puente de Luca, it's a bilingual uh, book, and I wrote both versions in English and in Spanish. And then um, Eunice and Kate was published only in English, but I hope that one day it will be published also in Spanish. Who knows? My next book is also going to be in English and in Spanish, and I also wrote both versions. Wonderful. Thanks, Mariana. How about you, Natalia? You want to unmute yourself? Natalia. Oh, yes. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And um, thank you for inviting me and to all of you for being here today. Um, so I was also, I was born in Lima. And um, like Mariana, Spanish was my first language. But I came to the US when I was four. So I often talk about how it Spanish was my first language, but by now English feels like my more proficient one. Um, I really do write and read more in English than I do in Spanish, although you know, I do um, still understand it and, will, and can write in it. But I, I, just, I just think that the, the flow, the fluency for me comes from English. And um, you know, when I, was, when I was young and I started school, um, my mom was very adamant about preserving our Spanish. So at home, we could only speak Spanish. Um, and as a result, really Spanish to me became a language of home. And so academia, things that I learned in school, things that I would learn or read about in books, it was like this um, separation of the languages, like each language has different contexts for me. Um, and even just being you know, someone who lived both in Miami, then in Central Florida and in South Texas, um, Spanish became a language that wasn't just about my Peruvian Spanish, but it was about the, Span the different kinds of Spanish that were um, coming from the people in my community. So being in Miami, sometimes like if my friends were Venezuelan, Cuban, um, being in South Texas, if my friends and community was mostly Mexican, um, I was really, I've, over the years, really become come to appreciate the ways that um, that we share languages, but we can also really uh, appreciate all the ways that they're very different. Uh, and so in my books, you know, I have, um, in running, the family is Cuban American, and they are, they live in Miami, and Mariana's father is running for president, and she, it's really a, a coming of age story about her own, her stepping into her own political beliefs, even when she realizes that they don't agree, uh, that she doesn't agree with those that her father holds. And um, my second novel for adults, for example, was set in 
South Texas, so it's about a Mexican American family. Um, so yeah, I'm very just I'm kind of always very fascinated by the different roles that our bilingualism play in our lives. Thank you, Renee. You want Hello. Hi, I am very happy to be here too. Estoy muy contento. I was born in El Salvador and I came here to the United States in 1985. So as Nariana and Natalia and also Lulu, my native, my native language is Espanol, Spanish. So what, I write, what do I write about? So uh, because I, uh, I was an immigrant and I was one of those who crossed three borders who has to come to the United States by a necessity without a visa, without papers. So I have the experience of crossing three borders. So I think in most of my books, our children and our readers can see my journey. Like in my, in my, in my book, My Shoes and I, Mis Zapatos y Yo, it is actually my book, Crossing Three Borders. I am very happy that my book is bilingual now. This book was published in 2010, and then it was out of print, but now it's back in a bilingual version. Books like From North to South, Waiting for Papa, all of those, I, I talk about the immigrant experience. But I am also a teacher. I work with little ones. So in, in, in my students, I can see that fight between living in two worlds and what is better, is English better than Spanish? And I teach in both languages. So that was my idea to create books about living in, in a cultural world, but at the same time be happy with the two languages. That's why I wrote the Tus Ferry Meets El Raton Perez, Señor Pancho Jara, Rancho Cha 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 Cha. And in those books, children can see, but wait a minute, Spanish is great. English is great, let's combine and let's have double the fun. So those are what I'm writing about and most of my books are in, in a bilingual version. Uh, and I think I, I right now I have only two books in English, which is Señor Pancho Jara Rancho and The Tus Ferry Meets El Raton Perez. Well, Rene, your answer really leads into the next question because I wanna make sure we have an opportunity to all talk about what we think, what you, our authors think, uh, bilingual books bring to children's literature. What are the unique contributions of bilingual books and books published simultaneously in Spanish only and English only, as opposed to only one language? And let's go ahead and ask that of Lulu. Well, that is a very good question because I, I personally believe that bilingual, the bilingual format works best in picture books that do not have a very lengthy text. Uh, and I believe that because it allows in a picture book, the bilingual book allows an experience, uh, the equal experiences for both the educator or parent that speaks only Spanish and the child that may be already uh, entirely bilingual or that speaks mostly English. Um, it also validates uh, the Spanish language uh, when it is side by side to the English and um, it's equalized. So that is my perspective. Now, um, Spanish only versions of N or dual versions for the same book are very valuable, like for example, in the early reader format. I personally believe that that is when you really need to have a separate languages because as an early reader, a beginner reader, you need to um, be, a, you know, be learning that language, specific language, whether it is Spanish or the English, in a way that is uh, most um, conducive to learn it well. So. That's wonderful, Lulu. I so agree. My chapter books have English. My Lola Levine chapter books have some English, are all in English and several Spanish translations because it would be too challenging in terms of design. But I love what you said about sort of the opportunity for multi-generational story time um, where like in my family, English is my first language. My mother's first language is Spanish and my grandfather, his only language was Spanish. So, um, correct, yes. thank you. Um, Mariana, what's your perspective on the 
contributions of these books? Well, yeah, of course, I, I agree with Lulu and with what you say that I, I think a lot of it has to do with the design of the book. And also, we have to keep in mind that Spanish usually is longer than English, you know, even though you're saying the same thing, you know, you use more words in Spanish. So I guess for designers, it might be a nightmare when they're trying to design a book with a lot of words. words. But um, also I, I think that, um, I think kids like um, comparing the two languages, you know, looking at them side by side. And uh, these are books, the books that have their dual language, give an opportunity for maybe parents and children to, to read together, you know, parents who are, you know, first language is Spanish or so. But also, you know, I I think, uh, especially people who buy books, parents, mm -hmm. they need to realize that bilingual books or dual language books are not only for people who speak the other language, you know? So, and this is something that I sometimes get a little bit worked up about <laughs> because I've had situations where I've been at a book festival and for example, the child comes and picks up my bilingual book, right? And then, you know, then, oh, look, let's get this one. And then here comes the mom and says, oh, but it's bilingual. I'm like, okay, well, you know, you can read either language, you know, so, um, but sometimes, you know, some people pull away from the books because they see they're bilingual. Um, being a bilingual person for me doesn't make sense. I, I would buy a, a book that is in English and Russian, even though I don't speak Russian. I can speak, I can, I can read the, the part in, in English, right? But um, so, you know, so I think that's probably why some publishers don't want to put a lot of, you know, money into uh, producing bilingual books because some people are still pulling away uh, from that when they see that it's a, a dual version. Hopefully, you know, that's changing and I think it is. And, um, but I always want my books to be published in both languages, you know, so I don't know, the same version or, or different versions, uh, but still I want them to be published in both languages. It's really important for me. You bring up some outstanding points. One thing I have noticed is that uh, because of the design of heavy text with bilingual books, which is wonderful, two beautiful languages side by side on the page, when I have Spanish only and English only, I seem to have more foreign, uh, translation sales, which is interesting. It's almost like we lack the vision for mm -hmm. to know that it can be translated into just one, one language. But we're here to change that with conversations like these. Natalia, what's your perspective? Yeah, oh, I love hearing these perspectives because I, like, I, I, I don't write picture books, um, although I would love to. Um, I write YA, and so um, with my book, um, it's written in English, and my characters code switch. So I would, I kind of fall more into the Spanglish part of this conversation. Um, and something that I hear a lot is people will say something, will say things like, "Oh, I love how the Spanish is sprinkled throughout." And as lovely as that, I know it's meant as a compliment, but um, a, I. It's, it's actually very intentional. It's not sprinkled at all. Um, the ways that I use Spanish really have to do with just trying to tell the truest story, you know, to try to really capture the ways that my characters speak. And it often has to do with how they're feeling in a, in a particular moment emotionally. Like there's moments where, even though I said like I usually speak in, in English, there are moments, um, depending on who I'm speaking with, how I'm feeling that I will reach for my Spanish. Um, there are also words that like there's a there's a section in in running in which my character Mari, um, she uh, or well, actually a character named Chrissy says I have a whole maleta full back home full of candies you know and my editor at one point was like why this random word like why not just say um, that she has a suitcase full and I said well because there are certain words that I only call Spanish words. You know, that like, I don't think of suitcase because to me, when I've traveled my whole life, it was with my family. So when we're packing, when we're at home, it's, estamos haciendo la maleta, you know? And I I will just pull certain words. I would never say ladle, for example, because again, if I'm making dinner with my um, my family, I would have said, pasame el cucharón, you know? And so for me, it really is more about, um, capturing the rhythms, the feel, the emotional feel of how we code switch. Um, it never is feeling like two separate languages. It just, just feels like we're using all the words we have regardless of whether they're in English or in Spanish. Um, 
And the other thing is that um, in terms of whether they're translatable or not, sometimes you can tell by context, someone who maybe doesn't speak Spanish could, could figure them out through the context. But there are other moments where I'm okay with them if, you know, if they don't have a direct translation because the beauty of language is sometimes not everything can be fully translated. Um, but if it is something that I know, like I will often put in certain words simply so that the readers who can recognize them will feel like, oh, this book sounds like my home. I want them to feel at home in my books. You know, and there's so many times growing up that I didn't necessarily hear the language of my home in books. And um, and so that's what I try to do. That's how I, um, I you know, for me, that's what it, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not sprinkled. It's like, I'm just trying to tell a true story and make people feel like, yeah, this feels familiar. Um, and then for those who maybe it doesn't feel familiar, there's so much you can learn just about the beauty of language um, through that experience. And perhaps they can learn about what it's like not to be on the inside and they can make the effort, the kind of effort that immigrants make every day in the United States. So it really is an interesting rhetorically in terms of the reader walking in the shoes of not understanding everything immediately and easily. Yeah. Okay. But if I can say something, uh, yeah. Natalia, it is um, important to notice that your book is YA. So it's entirely uh, appropriate that these um, characters are speaking as they leave their experiences. And um, the reader is an older reader and he or she will probably grasp your meaning perfectly fine. Mm. Yeah. And while we're on that subject of sort of code switching, if you want to use that phrase, do you, all of you who write with Spanglish, if you want to call it that, or code switching, do you use italics or not? Um, personally, I don't. Um, I don't, I, you know, my first book I did, my very first book um, came out in 2014, but I also, I didn't know that I could choose not to. Um, and it wasn't until I learned that like, it's like, hey, why, why, why did we have to italicize? The italics kind of symbolize a foreignness. Um, but again, to me, my languages aren't foreign um, and I don't like them to stick out in that way. Um, I don't like, I, I don't want to other them. And so, yeah, I don't use the italics. I want to jump in for a second here. Go ahead. And that is that I did use italic, italics on this book, uh, Us in Progress. And I did because um, unlike Natalia, I've been doing this for, for decades now. And so when I was doing that collection of stories, uh, Us in Progress, um, it was, it's really to the, I mean, it's really for kids in fourth to sixth grade. So um, I really didn't want the English language learner, I mean, the, the I'm sorry, the native speech of, of English to be entirely, not entirely, but to be, um, not to be able to grasp what was going on in the stories. Um, and it was important for me that that monolingual English reader um, that may not be at the same reading level of his peers, maybe behind, that he was still, I, I wanted him to be engaged in the story. And by having the italics, it makes the reading experience for that reader easier, especially if he's behind in reading. I don't want him, I don't want to lose that reader. That's what I'm trying to say. Again, this book is not YA. It's wonderful though to hear the different perspectives because it's changed even since I've been begun writing a chapter book. And I now too choose not to italicize. Again, um, we have, sometimes we have choices, sometimes we both, we don't, but we are not a monolith and we bring bring different perspectives to these same issues. Rene, do you want to say a few words about what uh, bilingual books bring to our children's literature community? Yes, I can I can speak for the point of view of the teacher. I, I work with kindergartners, first graders, TKs, and, and with families. And I can see uh, the love of the bilingual book, especially for the little ones, because the books are both English and Spanish. 
Uh, it is a book that the mother can read to the child in Spanish. The boy can read the, uh, the book uh, uh, in English. And also for the price, I can say, oh, maestro, I can buy like two books in one. So, and I also, I have received many emails from high school teachers and from university teachers, and they are using bilingual books to teach Spanish. So that is wonderful. But I, I also like the idea of having two books, like twins books, one in English and one in Spanish. And children also like that one too. So they can read one book first and then they can read the book, the, the, the other book later, depending on their language. If they're there. Okay. That yeah. is awesome. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we only have a few minutes and I want to yeah. make sure to get to the next question because we have some aspiring uh, Latinx children's authors. And so I want us to be honest and share if uh, what the particular challenges of bilingual, writing bilingual books are, um, how you make your decisions, I think uh, about when you're gonna use code switching, if you feel there's, how you deal with the idea of a universal uh, Spanish and also, um, if you've seen changes in uh, publishing in the United States in relation to bilingual books and Spanish only books. So this is a chance for you to share some of your wisdom uh, as to challenges, but also advice for young or emerging writers. Lulu, you want to start? Or maybe let's have Rene start since I cut you off uh, with your last wonderful answer. Right here. If you can shift yeah. the positive to some of the challenges. Yes, uh, the, the positive is about, let's see, when I write mostly in my mind, it is like a mix of languages. When I start writing my first draft, it is like I'm writing in English, uh, but maybe thinking in Spanish, or otherwise I'm writing in Spanish, but I don't know that word, so I use the English, and then I fix it. I remember when I was writing my book, uh, Mama the Alien, Mama la Extraterrestre, I wanted to use como dos gotas de agua. That was my main idea. But then I think, how do you say that in English? Will that work in English, como dos gotas de agua? And then I searched, uh, I, I went to Google and I searched and I found like two peas in a pod. And I say, perfect, I got it. So I was happy that I was able to use in Spanish, como dos gotas de agua, because I want thinking about the translation into English. I, I can see like now, I can see more publishers publishing books in Spanish and bilingual books than before. I remember when we started, remember Monica, there were only a few, a few bilingual houses. And now I can see like the major houses now are trying and publish more books in Spanish and in bilingual versions. So I'm, um, happy to see that and i hope that they continue so we can publish more books in spanish and bilingual books in the united states thank you renee lulu challenges and things to consider in the industry well uh definitely the challenge is like is means already that for every english word you have three in spanish so it's a challenge in design, um, challenges that I absolutely adore because I adore challenging a book. Um, there, historically, I will say that there has been ebbs and flows in the uh, uh, way that uh, the industry has um, uh, proposed bilingual books or made published bilingual books available to kids and to students and educators. And Perhaps it may be, uh, like I said, I've been doing this since the 80s. Um, it may be mostly related to uh, different laws that happen in the state of California. Um, uh, um, you know, at one, I'm not gonna go into the history, but uh, there were different propositions, one of them in which uh, they, the bilingual education was um, disallowed in, in uh, California public schools. And at that point, the rise in the bilingual books in the 80s and, you know, have them flipped, literally almost disappearing. And, um, but now I think um, we are in a good position and this is good for uh, the young Latinx um, bilingual writers 
uh, or Latinx writers, because I believe, like we've said already, that um, all forms of uh, of uh, language, um, you know, whether it's translinguism or bilinguals or English or Spanish or you know, Spanglish, whatever you want to call it, everything is valid if it's well done. Um, in 2017, there was an end, there, uh, it was the end. 2017 marked the end of English only in the public schools in California. And that means that the um, world has opened up for uh, bilingual books and more books in dual versions. And I think that we are seeing that. I don't know whether you notice it, Monica, but I think that we're seeing that. And it's very exciting uh, to see how many more Latinx authors and illustrators are right now. It's just fantastic. I would agree that we are, I, I guess the word renaissance isn't um, necessarily the right one, but I think the talent was there all along, but we're helping each other. There's so many amazing organizations that we're bringing new voices, but the talent is unbelievable. And speaking of talent, one of our newer voices, Mariana, um, would you like to comment on this? Some of the challenges you mentioned one earlier, but any advice, any thoughts on this topic? Yes, well, um, yeah, for me, uh, writing in English, you know, every time is a challenge too, because it's not my first language. So, you know, I have to really uh, get into the story and make sure I have the right vocabulary. I've said many things that, you know, usually my first drafts sometimes have words that have nothing to do. You know, I'm just kind of making them up because they sound the same in English and Spanish. So, you know, I've had many uh, bloopers that are really, you know, funny, but um, maybe some other times, you know, I will, I will tell you about that. So, you know, just uh, that first, those first drafts are very important to me to make sure that I'm really using the words that I want to, sh uh, that I'm, I want to say, to use and conveying the right feelings and emotions. Uh, but, you know, luckily I have a super tool that is my bilingualism. So whenever I can find a word in English, I just put it in Spanish, you know, and, and later, you know, like Rene does, you know, then I look it up and then, oh, okay, this is what I'm trying to say. So when I'm blocked and I don't know what I'm trying to say uh, in English, I, then I write it in Spanish and vice versa. When I'm writing in Spanish and I don't know what I'm trying to say, I just think of it in English. And then uh, when I'm editing, you know, I make sure that I, you know, uh, I'm writing the right uh, the right thing. So you know, I uh, for me, bilingualism is a challenge, but also a super tool. So so um, so you know, for the, and for the kids who are uh, watching us right now, I just want to tell them that you know, life is full of challenges, um, but you know, we're here to overcome them. So I, I write because I love uh, communicating with children. I love to tell stories, and um, you know, I hope more kids uh, begin writing either in English, in Spanish, in both, you know, in as many languages as they can. Our stories are very important, yes. Yes. Natalia. Um, one thing I would be, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I think it's important to also, um, for us to acknowledge within this conversation that there are, it's also, it's also totally okay to not include any Spanish at all in your books. It, even like as a Latinx author, there are a lot of Latinx people who don't speak Spanish and that's okay too. And it's not in any way a statement on whether you're Latinx enough um, or, you know, it, even like for myself, when I was growing up, I remember the first time I went back to Peru, my cousins made fun of my Spanish like terribly. Um, and it, it was not just the way I spoke or my accent. It was that even my slang was from like the 70s because I only had the slang of my parents. You know, I grew up hearing their, their, their Peruvian Spanish. And then I'm here um, bringing to my aunt, like bringing from Miami, this like mixture of like Cuban Spanish, Puerto Rican Spanish, Peruvian Spanish, you know, and, and it took me so long to realize how beautiful it was. And to realize that it's okay and that it's okay if I represent that in my work. Um, and so, it, you know, whether you're someone who maybe has a similar experience or whether you're someone who maybe doesn't speak Spanish, like in my own, um, uh, you know, there's a long history, you know, like the pressure to assimilate is a real thing. A lot of people don't 
um, past Spanish down across generations because um, they're worried about being discrim discriminated against or for whatever reason, but this like our languages and which one, like what we have, it's its own beautiful story. So I would just say to, um, to not hesitate to represent that on the page. And whether that means there's Spanglish, whether it means there's code switching, whether it means it's, you know, translated in both versions and it's fully bilingual or it's not at all. Um, I think the beauty of it is that like our languages are vast and there's, this, there's such breadth to the ways that we're sharing it. Uh, and I hope that we can fully capture that, like all the different ways that it exists on the page and in our stories. Thank you, Natalia. That is a wonderful answer. And I represent, Spanish is my second language, but I am not proficient uh, enough to do the beautiful work of professional translators, like the ones I've worked with, like Adriana Dominguez and Carmen Zafoya. And even when my mom was alive and I submitted my Spanish translation, worked on with her to my first publisher for my name is Gabriela, me llamo Gabriela. Um, they said they didn't want Northern Peruvian Spanish, and I was a little bit hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I realized it's its own art form, and it doesn't make my story any less South American. Um, that I got to collaborate with a translator, as many Latinx writers do for their bilingual books. And even whatever knowledge folks bring, they are part of that collaboration process. Now we are gonna end with a very special treat. We have students from all over the country who've submitted questions uh, to these wonderful authors and we have time for a few. So let's see the first question from Naley A, sixth grade, South Carolina. Why did you create your first book? And I think this is for Lulu, so let's listen. Esta pregunta es para Lulu Ledrake. Why did you create your first book? Well, um, why did I create my first book? You know, I actually, as a writer, the first book that I wrote is came about because I created characters that I drew. And from those drawings, uh, the book was born. Um, but, you know, I have now 42 books and I'm sure that others will like to respond. Um, I will say one thing though, why did I create the very first book that celebrated my heritage was 31 years ago. And that was Arroz con Leche, popular songs and rhymes from Latin America, right behind me, <laughs> right behind me. Uh, that book I created because I couldn't find a book like that uh, in the stores or in the libraries, a book that reflected the heritage of that I grew up with, the songs and rhymes that I grew up with uh, from Latin America and the folklore that I still think is super valid in order to instill the love of language and the love of love of rhythm um, and the love of our heritage in a young child. So I didn't find it. And I said, like I tell every single child when I go to schools, Kids, what do you do if you really want something and you can't buy it or you cannot borrow it? What do you do? You make it. Wonderful. How about you, Mariana? Why did you create your very first book? Well, I wrote my very first book, I think, because I'm a writer, you know, so I'm, that's what I've done since I was a child. I love writing since I was a little kid. And actually, I remember... Uh, probably I was eight or nine years old in Peru, and I read some books by Alma Florada. Um, you know, and I remember just putting my finger over her name because it sounded like music. I loved the way it's, her name sounds. And, you know, thinking that one, name, one day my name would be in a cover of a, book, of a book, you know. So so when the moment was right, many years later, of course, you know, I, I decided to, to write my first story and publish it. So, yeah. I love that, and Alma Flor would love it too. <laughs> um, let's make sure we have time for all the questions. So maybe let's listen to the second question and we can start with Renee and Natalia's answer. This is from Joel C, seventh grade, South Carolina. What is the hardest part of writing the book? And we have a video. Mi pregunta es, ¿cuál fue lo más difícil del libro? Renee, would you like to start? Yes, writing a book. I I begin by creating a movie on my mind 
and my I'm working it's like a movie what is happening next and after and then when I have a clear idea of what I want is when I started to write the story so by having that time of creating my movie on my mind until writing and then I think the hardest part for me as a writer is like I like to write in sequence I am not, I cannot write the second the second page until I am happy with the first one. And so and some writers say no that we can write the ending, the middle, the beginning. But it is hard for me to do that. But that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, Sandra Cisneros, who's inspired my mm -hmm. writing, says the opposite, and it helps me with my chapter book series. She says, I always love to write because I only write what gives me pleasure. So sometimes when I'm writing a longer work, like for my series, I'll write the scene that's the most fun, even though it's in the middle or towards the end. So that's one of my tricks. I'd love to hear from Natalia about what you think the hardest part about writing a book is, and then maybe like how you overcome it. That might be helpful to student writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bueno, Joel, gracias por la pregunta. Um, I think it's a very good one. Uh, I, For me, the hardest part is honestly sometimes just keeping going. Um, I often start out really strong in the beginning, very inspired, and I, you know, either it's usually voice driven or plot driven, driven, but I'm very excited in the beginning. By the time I get to the middle, I get to this point where just the insecurity, like my inner editor, um, really comes out and I start to think like, what am I doing? <laughs> and will this book ever come together? Will it ever make sense? <clears throat> and um, I've started to realize now that it's a pattern. I see it now. And so even though it doesn't get easier, it's something that I recognize. I often call it like the little writing monster who like, at least now I know him and I can recognize him and I know I've conquered that little monster, but um, it doesn't make it any harder uh, because insecurity is a real thing. And I think all writers, no matter how experienced they are, will um, encounter that at some point. Uh, I think it sometimes just means that you're doing hard things and you're doing important things. And oftentimes hard and important things are really scary to do. Um, so to get past it, I just have to really remind myself, like, you know, what, why am I writing this story? You know, um, who do I hope um, it will feel meaningful to? Like, who will I who do I hope will read it one day and it'll feel like like a gift for them almost? Because I know there's books that I grew up with that to me when I read them, they felt like gifts. Um, and that that really helps me keep going. But the other thing that just helps me keep going is consistency. Like I just think, you know what, today I only have to do like this one little scene or this one page. And as long as I do those things over and over and over again, I know that over time it'll add up to something. And before I know it, I'm through that hard part. Excellent. How about you, Lulu? Um, what is the hardest part for you in writing a book and maybe some advice for overcoming it? Writing in English. <laughs> that is definitely the hardest part. To tell you the truth for me, sometimes, and I say this to kids, um, some, because I, you know, I, I write many things, but, um, I'm very visual, so at times, if um, a story comes to me, I do understand that Lene has this organic way of saying things. I agree, I have that thing too going on. Um, but sometimes, for me, drawing the characters and letting those characters come alive in the page as drawings, they tell me who they are and how they will behave with one another. Of course, I'm talking about either early readers or picture books. I wouldn't try that with a YA, Natalia. <laughs> Thank you, Lulu. Um, I actually, for the first time for my new picture book, that'll be illustrated by the amazing uh, Adriana Garcia um, called The Turquoise Room, El Cuarto Turquesa. I drew a scene of a grandmother, a mother and a daughter flying because it's a magical realist text before I started writing and it was so wonderful. I've never done it before, but it did inspire me because sometimes that first page is the hardest to write. Mariana, do you have a quick advice for the or experience in terms of the hard part of writing? And over yeah, I think uh, for me, the hardest part sometimes 
is myself, you know, I'm, I'm the challenge. <laughs> so, um, you know, to overcome that insecurity, like, will I be able to do it? You know, will I be capable? And then I just have to remember that I, I've done it, you know, so sometimes, okay, yes, I've done it. I, I am, you know, I, I can do it again, you know, so that, that's a lot, it is the self doubt. And I, I'm also a lot like Renee that um, I have a movie in my head and I have to let it uh, I, I call it like a stew, you know, it's like a stew of characters and situations and I have to let it cook inside my head for a long time and it's cooking and it's cooking there and everything simmers together. And then finally when it's done or almost done, I put it on the paper and that's when I finish my cooking, you know, on the, on the, on the paper. So that's how I envision my work. And for kids, you know, I suggest that if they have an idea for a book, they just have to put it in paper. That's the way to overcome your not writing is by writing, you know? So that's, that's the main thing because ideas are not books, you know? So you have to write down that idea. So much great advice. Um, I tell my workshop when I'm teaching writing for children that writers write, we, that's, and on a daily basis or on a, you know, for me on the weekends, because I'm teaching during the week, um, but that time sitting in front of the computer, we all get inspired by the muses, but you have to hope you're in front of your computer or your journal to capture what they have to say to us. Okay. And then, and then, Monica, if you if I may, you know, with that, also the days that you can't write organically because you feel like you're disconnected, mm -hmm. read, you know, pick up a book and read because that's the best that you do for your writing. It's true. Or go for a walk sometimes. Mm -hmm when I'm stuck on a manuscript, I will read it and then take a walk. And it's in my mind, but I'm not like staring at it. And, or I go for a walk with uh, my husband or my friend, or I talk to my agent and talk it through with someone too. Wonderful. I believe we have one more student question. Okay, this is from Lily T in the seventh grade um, in Maine. And she asks, how do you decide the name of your main character? Does it just come to you most of the time or does it actually mean something? Let's start with Rene, who has two last names. I have written books about me. Uh, Rene has two last names and I am Rene the boy. But usually uh, when I am writing this story, it's like the story is telling me, my name is Beto, I am Miguel, I am Mario. <laughs> so at, uh, for my first book, I decided to use my brother's name. So Beto is the main character from my first book, René and René, for of course my name. And in Juguemos al Fútbol y al Fútbol, I use Carlos. Those are my brothers. But now uh, I let my, my, my story tell me the name of, the, of, of, of my character. Fabulous. Natalia, names and books. This is well, the fun part, kind of. I love this question. Um, in running, um, Mari is, her name's Mariana, and her name both came to me and ended up having a really significant meaning. Um, and there's a, there's actually a scene in it in which um, somebody tries to call her Mariana, and she corrects them, and she says, no, it's Mariana. My name is like the ocean because that's it has like the word mad in it. And it's very important to her that it be said in the way that it was given to her and that it be said in the way that her that it's it's, you know, that her parents say it to her, at, like call her at home. Um, and even if someone can't say it exactly the same way, but she is at least trying to make sure that it's pronounced in the way that um, that it was meant to be. And I think that's really important. And it was something that, um, you know, as someone who grew up my name always being mispronounced. Um, it just, I think names are so important and they're a sign, like to get them, to, to try to get them right is a sign of respect. Um, and they do have stories in them. And so I'm always also really curious about um, when I name my characters, I wanna know what their nicknames are. Like, so it's like, yeah, Mariana is Maddie, you know? And it's because I have such tenderness for them. And I also wanna know like, what can I call them um, when I want to express that tenderness? That's fantastic, Natalia. We are big on nicknames in Latinx <laughs> culture. Chiquita, gordita, and other things. Lulu, names. Yes, I would love to answer Lily's questions with uh, the name of my main character here, Lucy. And also uh, the name, because there is a relationship with the uh, main character of one of the stories 
on uh, in this book, Firstborn. This is Lucy. Both are named Lucy. Lucy comes from from uh, I thought about it comes from the Latin lux, luz, and Lucy in Lucy's source is called Lucy. The book goes from black and white, entirely black and white, to full color when Lucy discovers how seeing, how learning, how to see things in a different ways um, gives you superpower. It is also a book about bullying. In Firstborn, Lucy also sees the light the light of how to stand up for yourself to that bully that is your sister. So yes, one more thing. In Firstborn, Lucy, yes, is Lucy the main character. Her bully, the older sister, the Firstborn, who is the bully, is named Brigida. And I chose that not because of what it meant, but because it resembles to the word in Spanish, bruja. Brigida, bruja, y si la hermana es una bruja. <laughs> wow, that is so clever. Mariana, do you want to share one name that you chose and why before we end this wonderful conversation? Yes, for example, for in Eunice and Kate, you know, the book title is two names. And actually, the names came with me with the poem with the book so um and usually with in my case it's like that this, the ideas start popping up in my head and they come with a name already attached with a name and usually the names are not so for example Eunice is not as common as Kate so I liked that uh, uh contrast of both names one that was longer the other one that was shorter and a little bit more common so you know so I, it's usually um the way the character wants to present himself or herself inside my head you know they they have a name and they come and say hello i'm i'm so and so so write about me now wonderful well you can see the creativity of our authors i my agent had to warn me to stop using the same names because i love i'm a tia i call myself tia abuela because my mom passed so young that for my nieces and nephews i'm also like their abuelita their tia and they're so much younger than my kids but my agent, Stephanie Sanchez von Borstel said, stop using versions of these names. Cause like my daughter's Isabella and I would use Izzy, Bella, Isabel. <laughs> and same with all my little family members, my friends, children, because we are here writing because we love children. We love writing for them. And we like to honor the ones we know and what the muse tells us. Thank you all for this conversation. Those who are listening, please support beautiful quality uh, children's literature, Latinx children's liter literature. These authors have wonderful offerings. And if you can't purchase the books yourselves through indie bookstores and support the festival, then please ask your local libraries to order them or ask the, at your children's elementary schools. Thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful festival.